right, here we are, back at the bench, another day of honing, and hanging out with some penguins. Move these guys out of the way. And anyway, today's video is going to be a little, maybe even a lot different, because this is just like going to be blathering <laughs> about um, something I think about, and there'll be some applied science. Sometimes I spend some time thinking about what it was like to get a shave back in the 1800s. We know straight razors and shaving and whatever has been around for like forever since like, you know, whenever. But I don't identify with like people shaving in like during, you know, ancient pharaohs, whatever, all that Egyptian stuff. They had like bronze razors. I don't identify with it. So, to me, it would have to be, you know, to have a connection, it would have to be something, you know, 1700s or later. And, and the barbering boom, I think, started, you know, in 18, mid-1800s, and then later on when things started to uh, become more commercialized. And, um, you know, rural areas, things were what they were, but in, like, New York City and stuff, 1850 to 1900 was a major time in construction and what have you. If I look at old barber manuals and old uh, barber catalogs, there I don't find too much before like 1875. Everything else is is like after that. And once you get into like 1900, like there's a ton of stuff. So, I mean, that's just my research. I, I don't spend a lot of time looking that stuff up, but that's just what I've come across is what I should say. Not research, just like what I've stepped on. This is an old Washita. It's labeled soft. And uh, it's part of the story because, you know, getting a shave or whatever, going to a barber, uh, even if someone was shaving themselves. We know people were shaving themselves with straight razors back in the mid-1700s because that book, that Poganotomy book, is out there on shaving oneself. But I think for the most part, people went to barbers, you know, maybe once every week, maybe once a month, I don't know. So it wasn't the same type of thing that, you know, like what I go through is daily shaving. So people weren't doing that back then, not for the most part. Maybe if you were rich, you did, but, you know, regular folk um, were not. You know, uh, raises themselves, the form factor that we know, you know, typical straight, right? Allegedly, that form factor arose out of, uh, like, mid-1600s, came popular, and uh, went through several developmental stages. This one is from the 1700s, you know, and it's just out to, like, make a reference point. See, there's no tail. The scales are not perfectly straight, but very straight. There's a little tiny bit of a shoulder. I don't know if that was ground in after the fact. I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, the blade is really clean, so I wonder if it was reground, but I don't know. It's a huntsman, which is, you know, uh, poignant because, well, I'm not going to get into that. That's a lesson in steel. But if you search uh, the history of modern steels, you'll come across huntsman's name. Anyway, so this is from the 1700s, mid-1700s. Uh, then you have this stone that came with it, right? And this is really the crux of where I'm going. It has to do with, okay, guess so getting the shave and all of that, but someone had to hone those blades. <laughs> and my thing is like sharpening. Um, so that is really the main thing. Like, like what were they doing back then to uh, sharpen? So there's a codicule. And these two came to me together. I believe they've been together since the beginning of time. So that would date this to the mid-1700s also. It's like a little shard. It's not flat. I will not flatten it. It appears to have had oil on it. And it's very irregular. And it's a, you know, a bow. Out. Whatever. Somebody owned this. Shaved themselves with it. And this was the stone that they used to keep the edge going in between visits to the grinder. I believe most of the sharpening was done in grind shops. When I look through the catalogs, I don't see a whole lot about bevel setting tools or whatever. I only see tune-up stuff. Barber supply catalogs do list hones. I don't seem to remember seeing any pastes involved. You know, I don't seem to remember any pastes being offered. 
which is something that doesn't really make sense to me because chromium oxide has been around for a really long time. Red Rouge goes back to <laughs> Egyptian times, actually, I think. So that doesn't make sense. I don't know what the story is. I think grinders and sharpeners, like the professionals, I think they were handling most of it. I do believe that barbers did buy hones and sharpen their stuff, but I think starting in the mid-1800s, that was like a new and upcoming thing. And then that developed into a more regular thing as time went on. So again, back to like, you know, the 1800s and stuff, what was available. Now, you know, 1800s is still a very civilized time and lots of uh, goods were available, lots of machinery was around. Um, it wasn't backward time, really, like someone might think. If you got away from populated city areas, it becomes very rural very quickly. And there was probably a serious downturn in available technology. There was always mail order catalogs and there was always trips to cities and stuff. So goods were available, you know. So after poking around and looking into what people were using, and I'm going to focus on the United States because uh, Europe, been around a lot longer, has a completely different story or perhaps has a completely different story here in the United States is a little easier for me to deal with. When I look into catalogs for sharpening tools, and some barber manuals, what have you, you see codicules. These are listed. Eschers. I'm not going to drag every stone I have out, but you've all seen an Escher. And something called the Brazilian Hone. A couple other things I don't know. Uh, synthetic stones, like, you know, carborundum stuff was only available at the end of the 1800s, starting in the around 1830 or so, uh, maybe 1840, actually, 1840, I think, is when it started off. The Arkansas stones were being marketed. They've been around forever. I don't know when they were first offered for sale in a, in a store. <laughs> um, but as far as marketing goes, in other words, a, a manufacturer was cutting stone, packaging them up, offering them wholesale to vendors, that type of thing. That seems to have started around 1830. Now, this stone is pike. Can't really see too well, but it's a pike. This is a lily white washita. And if you read the old uh, manuals from uh, geological surveys from Arkansas, pike's name comes up. A couple other names come up. Uh, pike comes in at the end of the 1800s. I believe this stone is actually from the end of the 1800s. Have no way to prove it. Won't know. I know it's pre-1930 because that's when pike was uh, basically absorbed, at least in part, by Norton. Now, so we know uh, these stones were around because more work, more history, diving. Around 1840, a guy in the city, New York City, George Chase, had a stone shop up on First Avenue and 170th Street. And he was cutting Washita and Hard Arkansas. Did nothing about him branding. What I think, and I can't prove, not yet, but I believe he just packaged the stuff up, probably sold them a dozen at a clip, went out to a vendor, probably got put on shelves in hardware stores, probably called the USA Hone, Washita Grit, or Hard Arkansas Grit, uh, with a price or whatever. There's a lot of history here with Mr. George Chase because he was the guy from 1840 up until when he sold out to Pike. Now, I, I have to assume he sold out to Pike because there is a reference to Pike buying out Chase Brothers out of Brooklyn. I, I don't know what's up with that, but there was only one Chase selling Arkansas stones, and that was George Chase. I don't know if he had a brother. I don't know if he had a partner early on. He did have partners later on. I've done some diving on this. I've, I've pulled maps of uh, New York City from the 1800s and gone through all the developments on all the streets and compared addresses. I've done a lot of research. I've involved the New York Public Library research team and a lot of other stuff trying to figure out what that Chase Brothers in Brooklyn is all about. And possibly it was George Chase's residence or somebody got the story wrong. So we know that Arkansas stones were available from 1840 on through, and 
that they were sold to barbers because I've seen it in a supply catalog and so on and so forth. So we have these great stones and we know barbers use them to sharpen on. So that's interesting to me because when you have a washita and a hard arc, that's a huge jump. You know, and I think about today's level of refinement where we have all these stones available to us and everybody, you know, everybody's reliant on like, you know, super submicron powders and, and all these other claims. And, you know, you read about, you know, bullshit claims, but, you know, 60K JNATs and 30K ancient ocean stones or whatever other crap is going on. When back then, it looks like a barber had a washita and a hard arc. Maybe some had a codicule. Maybe some had an Escher. Maybe some had all of them. I don't know. That would be a lot of money for someone to lay out for sharpening their own stuff, but maybe it happened. I don't know. I can't find any documentation on that. So I'm thinking the, the simple barber had a washita. He had a hard arc, you know, and I find that amazing. What did he rely on for that extra bump of sharpness? What did he do to get from one level of sharp, one level of one level of refinement to that finished state? Uh, you know, it's like I don't know. It seems like there's a piece of the puzzle missing. So anyway, so I'm studying about this stuff and I'm thinking about like what the possibilities were. You know, I think about pastes being a possibility. This is not period correct because <laughs> I'm just not trying to go there. It's probably from 1950 or so. But this is a tub of red sharpening paste. I'm going to guess that a bunch of barbers probably, you know, at some point or another in time and take some of this stuff up, you know, and then just rub it on some leather. That's actually enough. And would have like a little sharpening pad. Oh, they could do it on a longer piece and use it as a strop, you know. So a simple piece of leather like this. One, two. Now, I'm imagining this. I, I don't know. I can't find any documentation. But I know people like who were barbers, they were also surgeons at one time. Creative people, people had to improvise. People had to come up with their own plans. I kind of feel like I'm sort of like that. So I'm thinking this is a good possibility because this is what I would have done. And so just give yourself a, a way to get some extra sharpness out of this abrasive powder. Washita is the coarse stone. Hard Arkansas is a fine stone. Washita is the first step in the progression. So I'm assuming, you know, that's where the barber went first. Here's another Washita. This one's a lily white. This one's a number one. The old manuals tell me Lily White is best. Number one is second quality. And then there's a number two that I don't believe were labeled. So I'm thinking they were just boxed up and sold off. I forget what the numbers are, but a cubic foot of Lily White Washita would have uh, a weight expectations. And as the weight went down, the stone was more porous. The grade of the stone went down too. So this is a number one, and it's, it's pretty hard and fine. Very nice stone. This is very early pike. Also, I believe, late 1800s or maybe early 1900s. I don't know. The reason it only has, there's no top label, nothing on the stone, no indicators anywhere, only this little humble ink stamp inside, which if you think about it, this has to be the beginning of his marketing. Now, remember, I spoke about George Chase. He didn't have any marking. You won't find a George Chase stone. At least, I don't believe anybody will. I do actually have a stone from New York, uh, from an address on West 22nd Street. George Chase did have an office on 22nd Street, but over at 2nd Avenue. That was around 1860. I believe there's a connection between those two addresses, but I can't prove it. The address on the west side where my stone is from, I can't get a read on there ever having been a business at that location that sold whetstones, but there was a marble shop there, and down the block were the um, lumber yards. So it is feasible that somebody was selling whetstones because lumber yards, you got carpenters, carpenters were using planes big time back in those days. Plane blades need to be sharpened, so I think it all ties in. Again, I, I can't, everything is conjecture and 
you know, conclusions based on evidence. I got this ink stamp. It's Pike. Very old stone. Down here. Used sperm oil. Now, when I was a kid, I went places I read about and studied about and saw stuff about whaling. You heard about sperm oil, sperm whale oil, all kinds of stories, you know. Started thinking about it. And then I remembered I cut a washita not too long ago. I cut a washita stone basically in half, and then I cut it into smaller pieces. But one of the pieces had like a smear, and I'm going to drop the photo of that in right here. And when I, I was thinking about this stone, and well, I was thinking about these stones, and I was thinking about this stamp with the used sperm oil, and I looked at that smear, which I, I, I don't recall from anything else. And it's a very particular type of smear. It's, it's not just like you got ketchup on a shirt and it's smeared. It was more like this. The surface of the stone changed right there. It was like more than just a mark. It was a complete texture that had burnished over. So I started thinking about it. So I started looking into it. So, of course, being the maniacal, obsessive lunatic uh, I am sometimes, I started looking at the sperm oil. Well, it turns out it's not really an oil. It's more like a wax. You get into esters and all this chemical and triglycerides and all this stuff. I don't want to go there. This video is already way too long. Substantially different than modern oils. Okay? So I thought that was interesting. The wax thing is interesting. The wax thing speaks to that smear. So I'm wondering, I had a stone, I was using sperm oil, and I had a liquid that was really a wax that was permeating the stone, I was honing on it, and this was a, you know, coarse stone or coarse earth stone. Wouldn't that liquid wax stuff make the surface a little smoother? Or would it actually allow me to really work my pressure more would it would it allow me to gain the full coarseness with with pushing down hard but when i backed off would it let me ride on top of that slick oil thing i don't know so i decided i want to check it out so so looking into the oils what have you and this and that and uh like i have this stuff it's old school from the 70s brown else when i was a kid you could like buy tortoiseshell picks at the guitar shop like my my guitar teacher had a bag of like hundreds of them you could just take one some had little rings of cork glued on them they were all different shapes and sizes and i used to pick this one size it was my thing and then all of a sudden boom it was no good i have a couple left somewhere same thing with this stuff uh, people who use uh who go hunting they uh, like it for their firearms because it doesn't respond to cold the way typical lubricants do, so it stays thinner and longer. In fact, the whole one of the distilling things, here I go into the sperm oil thing, uh, they would take the oil and then they would um, put it in barrels and leave it out through the winter, and the oil that stayed liquid was like top shelf. That was the best stuff. The oil that was... Um, still liquid in spring when and it was it was it was called winter oil it was called spring oil and there was summer oil and you know grades but anyway i have no idea what grade this is it's good stuff but you know whatever stuff uh, left over from my childhood now we also know in the world of sewing machines sperm oil oil is a big deal same with watchmaking I know about the sewing machine thing from a buddy who restores old singers, you know, the kind with the pedals on the bottom and uh, old cast iron and all that fancy artwork on them. He restored them. And uh, we would talk about the oil, but not the technicalities, but he kept saying that, you know, uh, I got to get the sperm whale oil. And, you know, it's been, you can't buy it new. It can't be made new. You know, it's like non-existent. He would use that on the critical points because it worked better. Or so I'm told. So... He have a bottle of sewing machine oil. This one is actually pure sperm. Not all sewing machine oil from back in the day is pure sperm oil. Some of it's sperm, some of it's sperm and whatever. Mix. This is pure sperm. Another thing, early sewing machine oil that doesn't say sperm on the label. If you look at the color of this, it has a unique look to it. It also has a unique sort of viscosity to it and when you put it in the freezer it goes solid but when you thaw it out you can see it's a lot different than any other oil you've ever seen this is a post 19 10 20s gus screw cap 
a bottle of sewing machine oil that's partial sperm oil. Another thing that's been laying around forever and a day. Anyway, so there's that. And, you know, the watchmakers, they have their own needs. So th this is sperm, but this is like stupid fine. This is like that winter stuff. So there's some different sperm oils. And yeah, I got into it trying to, you know, start off figuring out like what was going on back in like 1860. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add another layer of insanity to this diatribe, you know. Okay, before I go there. All right, so you had this, right? And then you would jump from this and you would go to a hard arc. And this is like really old. I don't know how old, but it's really old. <laughs> and uh, it's an old translucent and it's cut and polished on top and bottom, which tells me that whoever set this up really love this stuff <laughs> if it's in here like I, there's less than a 16th of inch of travel and that's forward and back right let's call that a 32nd of an inch and left to right nothing so whoever made this either got really lucky or they were a craftsman so this would be the next stuff I believe this came from a barbershop. Well, I mean, that's what I was told. So I started thinking about this, and I'm thinking, all right, so let's pretend I'm a barber. I got to do some sharpening. Now, my business hours during daytime I have sunlight. I could work by the window. You know, I might have gas lights. I might have whatever kind of lights, but um, by the window, I got daylight, fine. But I'm open for business, and people are going to come in. I don't want to be sharpening and making my fingers dirty and whatever. I'm not going to be doing that during business hours. So I would do it later in the day. Or maybe I would come in early, but it would be darker. Lighting, you know, lighting. So what I did was I picked up this old lamp. Hold on. What I'm going to do is have a little thing for it. So, and you can't really see the whole thing. There's an arm back here, and it has a hook on top, and there's like a wrought iron, a cast iron body, and inside these are oil lamps this is what people illuminated their homes with back in the day and believe it or not these things were like way popular up until like the end of the 1800s so what i'm going to do is i'm going to kill the lights okay This is the amount of illumination that, like, we're talking about. And it may look like it's sufficient, but it's nothing like what I had going on before. Okay? And I'm really impressed that people got things done working with lamps like this as their main source of light. I really, yeah. It's, it's mind-boggling to me. I mean, I know it happened. I, you read about it, but until you actually do it, yeah, it's like really crazy. So what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to put some of this oil from the sewing machine bottle. And I tell you, it, it you, you can feel that this stuff like is a lubricant, but it doesn't feel like machine oil. It's got a different type of feel to it. It also has a different type of odor. And the bottle that I showed you, this thing, has the same odor as this. 
which is one of the tells. I think that there's um, sperm whale oil in that bottle. Now, don't go out trying to buy sperm whale oil. It's illegal to buy. You can't transport it. You can't, whatever. You just you either have it or you don't. You know, you don't need it. This isn't about sperm whale oil and it being better. It's just, it's about sperm whale oil and things being different. Now, this is a gold dollar. I'm not going to muck up an edge on a good blade in the dark here because I, I literally, I can't see all that well. Immediately, I'm cutting. Feeling while I'm cutting, way different than my Tomoglad oil or any other oil I've used on these stones. And if you're wondering, you know, yeah, this is an animal-based oil, but it was rendered out so fine. It, it's not like it stinks like fish or anything like that. You don't smell that at all, all right? There is an odor just like almost anything has an odor and the odor is different than machine oils and other lubricants I've used now this is a soft wash sheeter and you can't tell because I'm not doing side by side with the stone with another oil or whatever so you just have to rely on what I tell you I'm picking up from the feedback. But the sound of the stone is completely changed. The feel of the stone is completely changed, but I'm still getting really good cut. Now, this stone isn't dead flat. I'm just doing this to demonstrate. I can feel that I have a little bit of an upsweep in the stone here, so I have to kind of gauge myself and my approach. I'm only saying that in case you're looking at the blade and you're like, why is he doing this or that? I don't even know if you can see it. But I'm thinking what it must have been like to somebody in 1875 or so when this is what he had to work with. That's really all this is about right now. This isn't about how I hone or, you know, washitas versus Naniwa 1K or whatever. This is just a vlog about, you know, sort of opening up my mind and gaining a new perspective on a whole different like sort of level. I hone a lot. <laughs> I work with a lot of different stones. I try so many different approaches and this, that, and the other thing that I can't help but let my mind wander this way. It just happens naturally. When I got a stone from the 1800s, I start thinking, who owned this? What kind of stories could this stone tell me? Who owned on it? <laughs> what shops was it in? What did it hear? Yeah, I, I know. Stones don't hear. You know what I mean. The other thing is with this oil, I don't have to add more oil. I don't know what it is with this stuff, but it's not like... This is a porous stone, and it's clear, so like typical machine oil would soak in and right about now I, I actually a little before right about now I would have had to add more oil I don't need to do it so could it be that our forefathers actually had an advantage with their available technology over what we have today
I don't know. Is this oil better than, you know, 3-in-1 or any other modern lubricant? I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say yes. You know, I, I'm not into killing whales. I, I'm into conserving whales. Uh, whales are our friends. Uh, I would never endorse going back to what we were doing back in the 1700s and 1800s with whaling. We killed hundreds of thousands of whales to produce, you know, ivory and oil and food and meat and blah, 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 blah. And the whales almost went extinct. And I don't ever want to see that happen again. This is amazing stuff, though. Tell you that. If it was available and no whales had to die from it, like, how could that happen? So that's pure fantasy. But if it was available, like, let's just say someplace there was like a gazillion gallons of this stuff that, you know, whatever, didn't come from whales and it was free or whatever, what I, I would use it, you know. You know, if, it, if, if this oil, okay, wasn't tied to um, all the shit that comes with, you know, nearly wiping out our planet's uh, resource of those wonderful animals, if there was a, a way to get the oil without harming the whales in any way, I, I would use it. I would definitely use it, but that's not the case, okay? And I'm not saying that anybody else should go out and kill whales to get this oil because it's just honing razors, and I'm just talking about comparing one to another. I can certainly hone well enough on the oil that I that is available. Comparatively, I got I I got to give the nod to the sperm whale oil, though, man. It just and you know it's interesting that you know a product from way back. Um, at least to me, is seemingly superior to um, products available today. All right, so I'm going to turn the lights on. I'm going to move this guy back to his perch. Cool lamp. It's been burning all day. I'm on like 12 hours now. All right, so after the washita, naturally you're going to move to the hard arc, which is finer. Now this down, I'm only going to put literally. You know, I was trying for two drops. I wound up getting three. Wasn't really what I was looking to do. Put a couple of drops on here. This is literally too much. So, you know I'm no stranger to translucent arcs, right? I haven't lapped this because I can't bring myself to eliminate, you know, 150 years worth of wear. <laughs> if someone's going to, I'm going to sell this one. I, I may keep it. I, I don't know. It's I can't keep everything. This one's special, though. So whoever buys it, they're going to want to dress it for themselves. They can do that. For me, I don't need to rely on this stone, so. Now, you notice there's no real visible swarf, which is typical for a very, very fine, very, very, very hard arc. So the question is, was my work on the Washita, where I started off with more pressure and then backed off as I went. I guess I should have narrated that part better, but that's what I was doing. 
because the arcs, you got to work the pressure, and the less pressure, the finer the stone behaves, but you have to be careful because you want even polish on the edge, so sometimes when you back off, you wind up with toothier. You got to know your stone, and you got to handle the, uh, the honing uh, appropriately against how the stone is. I have more work to do. This will take a while, so I'm not going to do the entire thing here. So there is some swarf on the stone. You can't really see it. I can see it from my angle. I have to be really careful because this can cut me pretty badly right now. Yeah, I can see in the reflection, catching the light, that polish is coming up on this blade. And even more of the striations have been mitigated. So another bunch of laps on this. This is a short stone. It's like five inches. So I'm not getting the benefit of a full eight or ten inch stone. So that increases the lap count. Anyway, more work on this, right? And I would get to a point where the Washita work would have been mitigated. What I'm not going to have is the kind of edge that I would normally expect from one of these. I have to go back to the Washita and really work the Washita stage where it was just about shaveable. I did not achieve that with what I showed you. It takes longer and it's more work and it's kind of hit and miss, so sometimes you have to go back and start over. So right now, let's say it's the 1850s, the 60s, 70s, and I got to this point with this. I can shave with this when I'm done. I'll probably shave with it now, but I'm not just not going to be jumping for joy with it. I remember the cowboy didn't get like a five pass, you know, uber lather type of thing. But I really don't think, you know, that whole with the grain, against the grain, whatever else was something that was happening every time a cowboy went to go get his uh, beard shaved off. I just don't think so. So it was probably once down, once up, and a little lilac water, and we're done. These old trans arcs will give you the finest edge that you could ever imagine. But the only way to get there is to bring to this surface the finest edge you can make. Simply, a Washita is not capable of delivering that edge. It'll get you pretty far along. It might even get you something you can shave with. But if you want to maximize the potential of this stone, you literally have to go further than Washita will let you get to. So the old system of those two stones is a little limited. Now, they didn't have anything to compare to. I have that advantage. I have a boatload of stones here and a lot of practice with using these. That's why I think pastes were part of the deal. I think people went Washita, hard arc, jump to a pasted strap, give yourself something with some extra sharpness to it. Maybe not so much uh, on the smooth department, but enough to like cut effortlessly, plow through those big old beards, and get a decent shave. Maybe there were some other techniques, maybe some barbers or smiths or grinders or whatever incorporated other stones i'm not sure there's no way to really know maybe people went from washita to codical to the arc could be maybe there was a thuringian involved i'm not sure but if i was limited to two stones i know it would be rough to see the maximum potential of this stone these stones can really do an amazing job but you've got to have that max edge and the washita is just too coarse to get there so maybe it was like Washita and then paste and then come back to this. Could have been any number of things. But anyway, that's uh, that's what I've been playing around with. And this is where my brain takes me. And uh, hopefully some of this made sense to you. <laughs> that That's my, you know, whatever you want to call it. My little thing about going back in time using the Wayback Machine. Remember remember that? Mr. Peabody, I think, was something. I, I can't remember everything, but there was a Wayback Machine. had to do with history and a cartoon, and I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Peabody. 
So I think Mr. Peabody was a dog, right? I don't remember. Vague memory of that. But when I have like a moment to breathe and I can just do some honing for myself and thinking for me and my brain, this is where I go. So I just figured I'd share that and do this vlog and, uh, you know, talk about what it might have been like. Might have been like, I don't know. I'm just kind of like talking about stuff that conjecture in my brain. So listen, if you have any thoughts on the matter, please leave them down below. Please comment. Please like. If you haven't, subscribe. It's always good. Hit the little notifications bell so you get told when I post a new video. People tell me all the time I don't post videos often enough. I've been on the same schedule for a really long time. So I think if you click the little bell, you get notified when I post. And I may actually post this really soon. And I just posted one a couple of weeks ago. So be like 100% increase in frequency. <laughs> anyway, look, this is fun for me, this type of thing. I hope it was fun for you. I hope everyone got a chance to maybe learn something. I hope everybody feeds back and pitches in on some good conversation about what they think it might have been like during the 1850s to show up in a straight razor. Keep it fun. Find what's fun for you. Chase it. Get out there. Do some honing. Get some great edges. Have some great shaves. Till the next video, take care. Talk to you soon.